The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. All right, we are back, everyone. Would you all have a seat there, please? And uh, let's open our Bibles to the book of Ruth. Book of Ruth. Man, I'm so thankful we're in the book of Ruth because after last week, man, it was kind of dark. You know, last week's um, study through Judges is interesting. You know, we really don't like studying how dark man is. And I, I have to tell you, I don't either. I much prefer talking about how glorious God is and how wonderful He is, which is what we're going to see in the book of Ruth. But in reality, we need to understand. You know, God places these things in Scripture for a reason. We need to understand just how dark man is so that we can appreciate that much more that God is doing something about the dark heart of man. God is doing something. God is transforming lives. God is the only one who's transforming lives that makes any difference for eternity. Amen? I mean, you can go to all kinds of self-help books, but if that doesn't help your soul for eternity, it does very little good. Amen? You can, do all kind, you can go to all kinds of counselors, but if that doesn't point your soul to eternity and the, the blessing of God, it's only temporal. But God changes eternally. We look at the heart of man and we say, oh, Lord, come quickly. And then you look at the book of Ruth and you see that he prophesies that he will. For he is the Redeemer. And the love the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is one of those favorites, I think, of everyone. Because it's a love story. Who wouldn't love a love story? But it's also a love story of God to us. Yeah, it's a story of Boaz and Ruth. But it's a story of God and us. And so we start in Ruth chapter 1. Of course, it's named after Ruth. But the characters that unfold in this story are wonderful, as we will see as we go through. Now, it came about in the days when the judges governed. All right, so the time period is during those dark times of Israel's past, when there was all this cycle of sin, and, you know, they would... They would turn their hearts away from God in sin, and then the inevitable would happen, uh, oppression, difficulty, life became difficult, and then they cry out to God after sometimes way too long, way too long would they wait, but then they would turn to God, God would send a judge, a deliverer, and, and you know, then they would start the cycle all over again when that deliverer died. So here, during that time period, when you saw the heart was so dark, you see God is doing something marvelous. During the days when the judges govern, when it says that there was a famine in the land. Now, the book of Deuteronomy tells us that the famines were part of their hard heart. In other words, when is that cycle of sin? When their hearts would turn hard, the land would turn hard as well. Because remember what God said, I'm going to give you this land, and it is a land flowing with milk and honey. If you got milk, you got cows. If you got cows, you got grass. And it's just lush vegetation. It's an indication of blessing. Flowing with milk and honey. If you got honey, you got bees. If you got bees, you got blossoms. If you got blossoms, you got fruit. You got, you know, uh, uh, things that are just blessed. The bounty of the Lord. Famine, because of their hard hearts, the land gets hard. In fact, there's a scripture that says, the land will get as hard as flint, because that's what your heart is. All right, so here is the time of famine. Now it says here, there was a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah. Bethlehem means the house of bread. We need to know that. 
house of bread, in Judah, which means in praise. So here they're living in the house of bread, in praise, in Judah, and there's a famine. There's something wrong with this picture. What's wrong is the heart of the people. But there's a famine. And so this man, it says, he went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Now, the land of Moab would be on the east side of the Jordan River, up on the plateau. So you kind of go up fairly high, and it, there's a fairly, you know, lush area there. Um, and so obviously the famine was not as severe there. So they go that direction to Moab. Now, a lot of people have very negative feelings about Moab. We understand why. Because uh, it was Moab that was trying to bring Israel down when they were trying to enter into the uh, promised land. Moab and Midian were the ones who came and really brought difficulty and trouble. And then we understand, of course, that God himself says of Moab, Moab is my wash bowl, which is not a compliment. Uh, the wash bowl is a place where people would wash their feet, and so it was dirty water. So you have this picture, God himself describes, Moab is my wash bowl, which is a picture for us of the world. And so here they're leaving. Now, the thing is, there's food there. And so, they're, you know, when you're hungry, you're hungry. And so they are leaving to go there. And they've sold their land in order to do this. They're picking up stakes and they're moving there. Now, we can look at this and say, well, was it the right thing to do or was it not the right thing to do? And, and I've heard and read different sides of that. I say, I, I'm convinced that God's promised land was Israel. In other words, that is their inheritance. You stay on that inheritance, good, bad, or ugly. Because that's where God placed them, that's where they are to stay. And what they need is to get their heart, heart right, not go to Moab. This is, this is my take on it. I'm really convinced that God gave them that promised land as their inheritance. And when they stay there, they're going to trust God in it. They're trusting God in that land. And so as I look at this, I say, Elimelech, which we see in verse 2, his, the name of the man was Elimelech. It means, my God is king. To which I say, if God is your king, then allow him to be your king no matter what happens. Don't look anywhere else. Oh, I want something better. You stay where God gave you the blessing. All right, his name was Elimelech, and his, the name of his wife was Naomi, which means pleasantness. Now, in those days, uh, of course, names had meanings that people knew. In other words, uh, when you named the name Noah, uh, Naomi, you can just know, oh, that means pleasantness. A lot of names today also have meaning, but we commonly don't know what they mean. You know, like my name is Richard. Many people don't know what that means. Uh, it means one who likes to... No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we, don't, you know, we don't know what it means commonly. We just, it's the name, you know. Uh, what does the name Steve mean? What does the name Gary mean? You know, we don't commonly know. But in those days, they would know. And they would commonly name their children... For various things, either they would name them as some aspect of God, or they would name them some character quality that they desired, or they would name them uh, having to do with something about their birth. Okay, so for example, uh, we could say, well, Naomi Pleasant is either a quality of character they desired, or perhaps she was just one of those good kids that just slept through the night and didn't cry all the time, you know, and didn't have colic. But you just looked at this baby and you said, oh, this is the sweetest thing, it's pleasant, you know. Maybe, you don't know. But they did name children after their birth, you know, situations. For example, um, you know, when Esau was born, he came out of the womb all hairy and red. So they named him Harry. And later his nickname was Red. Okay, so there you go. And uh, his brother, uh, when he, they're twins, when uh, his brother was born, they noticed that he had a hold of his brother's heel. So they said, look at that, isn't that something? He's got a hold of his brother's heel. Let's call him heel catcher. There you go. You know, so it, it could be anything. Now, what's interesting is that they had two sons who were named Malon and Chilion. And so Malon's name means sickly. 
So I'm kind of thinking that probably, maybe perhaps because of the famine, I don't know, but for some reason, the boy was sickly. And so they said, you know what, the boy's sickly, let's call him sickly. And uh, Chilion, you know, uh, his name means worn out or tired or pining. So they named their boys sick and tired. That's what they named their boys. And so, you know, apparently it's a reflection of the days and the times in which they were living. They were tough times. And so it says that Naomi's name was Pleasant and the boys. And it says that these are Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. By the way, Bethlehem sat right on the border of Benjamin and Judah. So he refers here to, to uh, a Bethlehem of Judah. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Now that's a, a tragedy. So here they leave because of a famine, thinking that they're going to go to something better, and in fact it gets worse. Now, there's a lesson, and we were looking at this over the, over the weekend uh, messages, that, hey, they thought that going to Moab, the wash bowl, the dirty water place, somehow was going to make life better. But in fact, it got worse. So, uh, Elimelech died. Now, for a, a woman in those days, that is tough, because uh, there were not a lot of social services and things like this, and a woman really needed the protection and the provision of a husband. And so he died. Now, at this point, it's not too bad because she has two sons. Unfortunately, their names sick and tired. But she has two sons. Unfortunately, however, it says here, uh, Excuse me. So she is left with her two sons in verse 4. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives, and the name was one was Orpah, and the name of the other one was Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Now this is devastation. We go from worse to worse still. Because her husband has died, and she looks to her sons now to be her provision for her old age. And her sons died, and they've already sold their land. They have nothing. She is absolutely wiped out. She has absolutely nothing left. Her sons have died. Her husband has left. This is the worst possible thing that could have happened to her. And so she has her two Moabite daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. And so it tells us that she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. All right, so she's going back. There's more than enough food in my father's house. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her, her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. So she really loves these girls. And they've really done well with her. And she says to them, because she loves them, she says, I want you to go back. Find some new husbands, and the, the, which was proper. Go back and find some new husbands. I, you know, she really loves them and wants it to go well with them. So she says, go back. You're going to do okay. Go back. So it says here in verse 9, May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely we return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, go back, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Now, it was the provision of Jewish law that if a woman's husband died, that the woman would be given to her brother, and that the brother would then raise up children through this wife, uh, and the, the woman's children would be taking the name of the dead father, or the dead husband, excuse me. And so there was this provision so that they would raise up an inheritance, 
And, uh, and this was what she said, do I have children in my womb? And if I did, would you even wait? So it says in verse 12, return, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, even I should have a husband tonight and bear sons. Would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And here we have her heart. She is blaming God for what's happened. The whole hand of the Lord is against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah, the name Orpah means, by the way, um, neck. And it could simply mean that when she was born, she was beautiful neck. But it means just simply neck. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth would not let go, clung to her. And then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go... Now, verse 16 is a famous speech. And frankly, a beautiful speech. For here we see in Ruth her heart, her character. And she says, Do not urge me to go. For where you go... I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. Now she is sacrificing a lot. She is saying, I'm going to leave mother and father and and everything that I've ever known, and I'm going to go back with you and I'm going to take care of you, and I'm not going to worry about a husband, I'm going to worry about you. And you got to just love her. She is just a woman of godly character. And you take a look at Ruth, and I would suggest, young men, when you're looking for someone to marry, may I suggest that you look very, very carefully at her heart. Because what's on the outside is one thing, but what's on the inside is so much better. Amen? And so you see in this woman this character. And so, verse 18, when she saw that she was determined, she said no more to her. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came about, when they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was stirred because of them. And the woman said, the women said, is this Naomi? So she's been gone 10 years. And she's uh, bereft of her husband, bereft of her children, and all she has is this Moabite woman who is with her, and they look at her, is this Naomi? And I'm convinced that she didn't look the same. In other words, being 10 years in Moab, I think, cost her something even physically. And I was mentioning this on, on Sunday. Have you ever met someone who's made the decision they're going to go whole out into the world? I mean, they're going to party. They're going to do the whole thing. You know, they're going to go into the, oh, the, the, the alcohol. They're going to do the drugs. They're just going to do it all. Sex, you know, just forget it. They're just going to go into the world. You watch them. And physically, I mean, on their face, you will be able to see the consequences, because there will be a, a wearing out, wearing out, just a, 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 just a hardness that comes in their bodies, even. And is this Naomi? And so it's interesting in verse 10, she said to them, do not call me Naomi, do not call me pleasantness, call me bitter, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. So she's blaming God. Do you ever blame God, by the way, when things don't go very well? Do you blame Him? Where's God? Where, you know, why is this thing happening to me? Where is God? And you know what's interesting is just when we cry, where is God? God is doing something so amazing, so marvelous, that we can't even imagine it. We can't see all that God is doing But the Scripture makes a promise to us and says, He even blesses you even while you're sleeping. He watches over your life, even when you're sleeping. In other words, even when you don't know it. You have no idea what God is doing. And I I just, I love that understanding, that biblical perspective. If only we can trust God and have the faith to believe. 
that here we are, maybe difficult things, some storm has come into our life, and then we see much later, you look back on it, you know, you look back on those times and you go, aha, now I see what God was doing. Oh, if I'd only known that then. Well, we can't know it then, but this we can know. God is good. God loves me. God promises to be for me. He promises He'll never leave me. He promises that He'll never forsake me. And the best thing that I can possibly do is to believe that. No matter what the storm, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what happens, the best thing I can do is to believe that with all of my heart. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Because this is the key. And maybe look back on your life. There have been dark times. There have been difficult things that have happened. I've done that. I've looked back. And I know that God has been faithful through it all. Amen? And God will be faithful in your life because He promises that He will. And so she makes a statement in verse 21. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Wait a minute. I thought that she left because she had nothing. They sold their place and they had nothing left. And so they left full. In perspective, now it looks like we left full. You know, perspective is an interesting thing. When we see a situation, we're commonly blind. We're commonly blind. But if we could only see from God's perspective, oh, would we see different things. Oh, would we see it so differently. You know what we need to pray? God, give me your perspective. This is a prayer that I think needs to be on my heart and yours. God, give me your perspective. Help me to understand from your word. Help me to understand from faith what's happening right now. And God will be faithful. He will prove it over and over. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Why do you call me pleasant? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned with her Ruth, I love that, with her Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is like Passover. Now, is that a coincidence? If you think that that is a coincidence, then there's a whole lot of other coincidences that you're going to see. I don't think that that's a coincidence at all. And in fact, what I see is the sovereign hand of God demonstrating who He is through it all. Notice this in chapter 2. Now, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth. Please take note of that. A man of great wealth. Of the family of Elimelech. So he's a near relative. Whose name was Boaz. Now, Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, Now, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, go, go, my daughter. So here's Ruth. She wants to glean. That was the provision of the law. The farmers would round the corners so that the uh, poor could take some harvest of whatever crop it was. And so Ruth says, let me go and glean for the both of us. You stay. Again, you see her heart. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And it says, And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Commonly what would happen is that the, fa- the, 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 the fields would run together. And in order to mark the borders, they would just pile up a pile of stones. So this whole, let's say this whole room was one field. This area over here might belong to one uh, a farmer, and this over here might be belonging to another one, but it all runs together. So what they would do is they would mark with stones where the boundaries would be, and the barley would just continue right through. All right? So that's just, you need to know that for what's happening. So she departed and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the portion of the field that belonged to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, it says here, she just so happened to come to the part of the field that belonged to Boaz. One of the points I made on Sunday. I don't believe anything just happens like this. That this is the sovereign hand of the Lord. Have you ever seen the hand of the Lord demonstrate so clearly that you say, there is no way that this just so happens? I have seen it so many times. I'm telling you, I have seen it so many times. Even in the smallest little things, 
I think I'm going to go, you know, I, I'm hungry. I think I'll go into this place here. You know, there's a Taco Bell. I think I'll go to Taco Bell and get a burrito or something. You know, I'm hungry. And you go in there, and you're, you know, you're just hungry. That's all you want in there for. And so you go in there, and then the next thing you know, you look, oh, there's so-and-so. This is amazing. And so you go and you sit down, and you get in, and you realize God made this appointment. Have you ever done that? God makes this appointment. God makes this appointment. God makes it. You go travel sometime, and you'll find that sometimes God will make appointments with strangers. They were going to witness with somebody, or just the word that they need is the word you're going to bring, or maybe a word that you need. God will bring a confirmation of something or an encouragement. And so I see the hand of the Lord moving. Have you ever seen God in awesome ways? And, I, and I've told you many times the stories of how God is blessed. I remember, just in case you haven't heard this story, I remember when I was in the restaurant business and I wanted to go, we were praying about being a, a pastor, wanted to go to Bible school, but it was a lot of money and I didn't have a way and I had this clever plan for how I was going to do it, which fell through. I heard about it on Friday. My whole plan just fell through. And I'm praying, oh God, you know, uh, my plan just fell through. What am I going to do? Then I just had this peace. Lord, I'm going to trust you that you're going to provide. I'm going to trust you. And I, Lord, I'm asking you, demonstrate yourself. Demonstrate your hand. So Saturday, this was my prayer all day Saturday. Go to bed in peace. Sunday morning, I like, I'm excited to go to church. I, yes, Lord, it's good, you know. And I go to church. I'm 10 steps in the door, and this man stops me. And he said, I have something to tell you. I said, what is it? God told me, he said, that I'm supposed to pay your way through Bible college. Now, that didn't just happen. In fact, he said, my wife knew that a couple of weeks ago, but didn't say anything to me because she figured that if God was in it, she didn't have to say anything to me. I'm just in awe of who God is. That's just getting started. I could write a book on all the things that God has done to demonstrate that His hand is sovereign and over our lives. This didn't just happen. So she departed and gleaned in the field, and she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech, just so happens. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. I love Boaz's greeting. You know why? This is in the time of the judges. This is a bad time. You had some bad people that were running around Israel during that time. And here is Boaz greeting his men. The Lord be with you, men. I just love Boaz. And they all say to him, the Lord bless you. Now you might say, well, they had to say that. He was the boss. I just don't think he was kind of that kind of a boss. I think that he probably chose men to work for him because of who they were. Don't you, you know what I'm saying? What, what I suggest here is that men of character like to hang out with men of character. And I just think that he looked at the guys he wanted to hire in the field, and he thought, you know who I want working for me? I want men of character working for me. And so when he said, the Lord be with you, I think he's looking at a bunch of guys that had some character, because that's who he was. And I think there's a lesson for, uh, for all of us. Who do you hang out with? Who do you really want to hang out with? Who do you like to be with? I think if you've got heart and character after God, I think who you want to hang out with are people with heart and character after God. However, if you like to hang out with the partiers, you like to hang out with the, you know, when we were in, uh, in high school, i got to go back a few years to remember this. All right, but if we, when, I, when you go back to high school, you know that in high school you have these groups that go together, right? I mean, we had the, you know, the nerds. Come on, we had the nerds. They're real smart people. They were the ones that made all the money later in life. And then we had, you know, the, the ones that were kind of the farmers. This was Hillsboro after all. And, and when we had the dopers, was your high school any different? And you, you know, they're the, the, the sports people. And so it's interesting because they hung out with these groups, whatever group they hung out with. So 
I look at Boaz and I see a man of heart and character. And I believe he chose men of heart and character. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? He notices her. Now, let's take note, however, that as I read this story, I don't see him looking at her and saying, wow, I really you know, want to get to know her. I mean, he does take note of her, but he's not interested right away like, wow, I'd love to marry her. I don't, I don't see that. And here's why. He's older. He's quite a bit older than her. And so he just sees her as someone who is very respectful and worthy because of what he has found out about her. Who is this young woman? And he doesn't know who she is. The servants in charge of the reapers answer and say, she is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now, and she has been sitting in the house for a little while. She's resting. So Boaz comes up to Ruth, and he says, now listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go and glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids, lest your eyes, or let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Indeed, I've commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. If you're thirsty, drink. Boaz is a picture of Christ, and all that he provides to us, I think, is pictured here. If you're thirsty, I want you to drink. Then, watch her reaction. She falls on her face, bowing to the ground, and she said to him, why have I found such grace in your sight? Why have I found such favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? She is befuddled at his kindness. And Boaz answered and said to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. How you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. I love his speech. It, what a wonderful declaration to her that not only is he taking notice, God is taking notice. May your wages be full from the Lord. And so her kindness is coming back to her. Her grace is coming back to her. And so she then said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, which means sir. For you have comforted me. Indeed, you have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Then at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain. And she ate and was satisfied and had some left. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servant, saying, Let her glean even among the sheep. Now, he's going to bless her even more. Again, this is a picture of Christ. Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her for it. Don't, don't correct her. And also, I want you to purposely pull out, purposely pull out for her some grain. I love the King James. It says, handfuls on purpose. I just love that phrase. Pull out handfuls on purpose. Because it's the Lord. I love the picture of the Lord. Pulling out handfuls on purpose. It's like, do you believe the Lord blesses your life? See, I'm convinced that the favor of the Lord are on those whom He loves. Does He love you? Scripture says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that He, you know, that they would have everlasting life. But what does He say? He adopts you as His son. He adopts you as His daughter. He says, if you, being worldly or earthly, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more God know how to give good gifts? I mean, He loves you like a son. Like you, you are His son. You are His daughter if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And just like a son or a daughter, He says, I want to bless you. Now, God knows how to bless. I mean, what father would spoil his child? It doesn't say, oh, you know, I'm the wealthiest dad in the universe, you know. Let me just give you whatever you want, you know. A Mercedes for all, 
three-car garage and a Mercedes for all. You know, he doesn't say that. Handfuls on purpose. It's a purpose. God is giving purpose in his blessing. God knows how to bless so that you and I become the man or the woman that God wants us to be. See, because what would happen if a father said to his son, I'm the wealthiest guy. You can have anything you want. Here's credit cards. Don't worry about the limit. Have you ever met someone like this? Tell me that they're mature. Because I've met people like that, and I can tell you something. I don't see maturity coming through. I remember when I was in college <laughs> that we had this guy he, he come to the school. And uh, he you know, he wanted to, as part of the fraternity, I don't recommend fraternities, by the way. I was in this fraternity, and here comes this guy, and his father is super wealthy. I mean, he's just super, absolutely wealthy. And uh, so he's going to join the fraternity. So, okay, fine, you know. And, and we got to know this guy, and I thought, this guy needs a few problems in his life. Do you know what I mean by this? Because the guy has no maturity. And apparently his father had protected him from all the troubles and all the difficulties of life because the guy had no maturity. You know what's interesting? It's the problems and the difficulties of life. Walking with God through them that brings maturity into our lives. You know all those problems that we thought, oh, my problems are so bad. You know something? God uses those problems. If we didn't have those problems, we couldn't be men of character or women of character. If we walk with God through it, if we walk with God through it. For as soon as we start getting hard-hearted and bitter-hearted and blaming God for it, we don't grow through it. But if we understand, indeed, God will walk with me through every trial and through every difficulty, it's then that we grow. It's then we become mature. It's then we become men and women who are mighty in spiritual things. We should not despise our problems. But understand that God walks with us through every problem. Do you know how many people are kicking against the goads of life? Do you know what I mean by this? They're resisting all the things that come out to them. This is difficult, and this is difficult, and that's difficult, and this is difficult. God's using every one. If we can only understand that God has His hand no matter where you are. Where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? No matter where I go, your right hand will lead me and lay hold of me. This is the key. This is the key. So he says, God knows how to bless on purpose. Handfuls of blessing on purpose. He doesn't just say, credit cards for all. On purpose. To make us to man or a woman. He desires. Because if you have a son, if you're a father and you have a son or a daughter, you want that son or that daughter to be a man of God. That's what you want. That's what you desire. I mean, what father would want for his son? You know, I'm going to raise you up to be a spoiled son. I'm going to raise you, my daughter, to be a spoiled brat. What father would ever say such a thing? We want our children to be men of... And when they aren't, it breaks your heart. And so he says, I want you to purposely, on purpose, pull out handfuls of bundles and leave it where she may glean. And don't don't correct her, don't rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until the evening. She worked all day. Here we go. Here we go. She's a woman of character. She's worked all day. She, you look at the thing. It says she was from morning. She took a break in the middle of the day. And she worked all the way till evening. There's something to be said about that. She's not afraid of hard work. This generation that's raising up around us, work is good. Amen? Okay, I won't even get started on that because it's like one of my pet peeves. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and then she beat out what she had gleaned. She wasn't even done working. She worked until evening, then she beat out what she gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. She got a lot. Of course, they helped her. 
And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, so she took it out and gave to Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. Remember, because Boaz had given her something, and she saved it. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today? And where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. I mean, the, Naomi's like amazed. Where in the world were you working today? So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and she said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. 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 Oy vey, Boaz. Aha! This gives me an idea. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Her mind Something is starting to click. Again, Naomi said to her, this man is our relative. And what is she referring to? She's referring to what's called the Goel, Redeemer. And so there is a law, the provision of the law, which I mentioned, that if a relative died, that there would be then the nearest relative would raise up an inheritance. But there was also the law of the Redeemer. So let's say that someone had to sell their land because of poverty or whatever, bad circumstances, famine. They sell the land. That the nearest relative can come and buy that land. So the nearest relative has a right of redemption. I will buy that land so that it will remain in this family forever. So her mind is starting to work. Now, we are intrigued because we know that Boaz is a picture of Jesus Christ, and we know that we have all been redeemed. In fact, the Scripture says, you are not your own, you have been bought with a price. And so we understand here that there's a picture developing, which we're going to see develop even further in chapters 3 and 4. So she says, the man is our relative, he's one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth now, I don't believe that she says with this with any tone of conniving. It's like, ah, ha, ha, let's see. If we... No, I think she's like, this is the provision of the law. Ruth, you have no idea. There is a blessing here unfolding. This man is our closest relative, and look at his kindness to you. There, there verse 21, then Ruth the Moabite said, well, not only that, and one other thing, he says, furthermore, he said to me, you should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Got the barley harvest, got the wheat harvest. Barley harvest is in the spring. They're going to be harvesting all the way into October. And so Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, this is good to my daughter. It is good that you go out with his maids, lest others fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law, perhaps not even knowing that she was going to be blessed beyond her wildest imagination. There's a scripture. God will bless beyond all we can imagine or even think that his heart for us is so wonderful if, if the scripture says no eye has seen no ear has heard the mind has conceived the things which God has in store for those whom he loves for we don't really yet know we look at this earth and we often make earthly decisions but God's blessing on our life is eternal. For when we understand His blessing, it ranges into eternity, and the heavens are ours, He says, because it's my inheritance, and we are co-inheritors. God's going to bless amazingly. Let's pray. Father, we love You. As we look to Your Scripture, we see the unfolding story of redemption. And Lord, we are so blessed with the understanding that we're not our own, that you have redeemed us. Lord, that you have, you have called us by name. 
that you have adopted us as your son or your daughter. And that, Lord, you would bless us in ways that we have no idea. We look at our problems, we look at the, the struggles, the storms, and, and, and we sometimes get so discouraged. If only, Lord, we can truly believe that your hand will never lead us, leave us, but your, your, your right hand would rather be with us and lead us no matter where we go. Lord, if we could only believe this. Church, tonight as we're praying, but I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know what storm you're going through. I don't know what difficulty you're facing. But I want to tell you that God already knows. And that he's already working in your behalf. The key is to stay in a place of full faith. Knowing that God will walk with you. God will be with you. But you need to acknowledge him in all your ways. You need to keep your heart looking to God, always. Don't allow your heart to be discouraged. Don't start blaming God. Don't start doubting God. Stay in a place of fully trusting and walking in faithfulness, and He'll bless you. So church tonight, as we're before the Lord, are you going through a storm? Will you trust him in faith? Will you walk with him in faith? Will you just say yes to him? Just raise your hand. Say, yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. I'll walk with you. I'll trust you. No matter what storm comes, I'll walk with you. Lord, here's my heart. Here's my life. Lead me in all that you do. Make your name great, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, can we worship the Lord? What can take a dying man? On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503 642 2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org on behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones may God bless you <laughs>